it's Michael Fabiano now with Sports Illustrated, and I'm here to help you through this wild fantasy football season. To win in fantasy, you need player rankings you can trust, and ours have received the Top 5 Accuracy Award over the last three seasons. Sign up for the all-new SI Fantasy Plus at si.com slash fantasy. We even have tools that sync with your leagues and experts who are standing by answering your questions in our premium chat. Sign up for SI Fantasy Plus at si.com slash fantasy and win your leagues in 2020. That's si.com slash fantasy. Today's podcast is brought to you by Blue Canary. The bird has landed on beautiful Bainbridge Island, conveniently located at 499 Madison Avenue. ASE Master Technician Clint Ramsey brings over 15 years of experience, award-winning diagnostic skill, and a desire to reinvent the automotive repair experience. Schedule an appointment online at bluecanary.biz or call them today at 206 451 42 I'm Maria Metzler, the Executive Director of Helpline House. The global pandemic has affected us all differently. If you or your neighbors need food assistance, mental health counseling, rental assistance, or parks and rec vouchers, please reach out. Helpline House can help in many ways. Find us on the web at helplinehouse.org. It's what we do. Neighbor helping neighbor. I got something for your mind, body, and soul. I got something for your mind, body, and soul. Here's your host with the most, Tiny Tim. What's good, Podcastville? You found the Bystander Podcast. Happy generic time of day to you. My guest today is Peter Orba um, from Port Gamble and the Ghost Conference that's coming up November 5th through 7th. 5th through 7th? Yeah. Peter, thanks for taking some time to talk to me about what's going on here in Port Gamble. Yeah, nice to meet you, and glad to be here. Yeah, so um, I hear that there's uh, paranormal activity out here in uh, Port Gamble. Can you tell me a little bit about the history of the what's going on? Sure. It's uh, kind of notorious for being haunted here. Um, well, there's written reports going back a few decades. There's even some reports as early as the 1960s of strange phenomena happening in some of the buildings. Uh, that's reported from some of the workers, the people that worked here. So it seems to have had a bit of a history here with the paranormal. And this um, is an old mill? Um, yeah, so it, Port Gamble it. itself is, is just old. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of Washington's first um, established towns. It was established in 1853, and it had a sawmill here like pretty much every other coastal Pacific Northwest town, and it mm. was built on the timber economy. Uh, and the sawmill here happened to run for 142 years continuously, so it's the longest uh, continuously running sawmill in U.S. history by a long shot. So the town's old, and it's still here. Um, some other things that make it really unique is that the founders were from Maine, and so the town looks like a New England town uh, when you drive through it. And that was something that the company did on purpose to try and get people to come out here early on when it was so difficult to get out here. So they wanted to make it look like home, and it's just always stayed that way. Um, so it was founded by Pope and Talbot, and they're both from East Machias, Maine. And it's a company-owned town, so there's not too many of those around these days. Mm. Early 1900s, late 1800s, sure, there was a lot of company towns, but there's really not that many anymore. And so it's still a company town. Um, we were Pope and Talbot were acquired by Rainier, uh, based out of Florida, another timber company, in May of 2020. And so now it's directly under um, Rainier and a subsidiary called Radiant. So 
Uh, it's still a company-owned town, which I think may add to things here. <laughs> um, there are more reports of hauntings in locations here than locations that don't have anything that's going on. So it's really rather interesting. Um, I moved here in 2007 and um, I had heard some of the stories and was just always interested in the history of this place. Um, and I started doing uh, ghost walk tours around 2011 when I started working for the company. And uh, then I really started to learn about all the activity. And so I like to ask people on the tour, what are, you know, what are things that they think may contribute to such a widespread haunting? Because it's really widespread here. You know, when you think of old West towns, the old hotel or the old bar, uh, there'll be like a centralized location where most all the paranormal or unexplained phenomena happens. Here, it's kind of all over the place. It doesn't really matter where you are or what house you're in. So that makes it unique. And, you know, a lot of people think tragedy at the sawmill is may contribute to the haunting here. Um, you know, that could be there's reports of fires over the years but it's surprising to note that only four people died on the mill site in that 142 years so what um, is it four dwellings with paranormal four uh more more than that yeah i'd say there's probably 20 and how do you measure this it doesn't even seem like there's 20 houses out here (laughs) (laughs) there's barely 20 there's a little more than 20 houses out here but uh, I guess how you would measure it is, well, there's no scientific instrument that tells you you have a ghost. There's no, nothing has been put out there to quantify what a ghost or a spirit or whatever you want to call it is. So you just have to look at the reports people have and the evidence that's possibly gathered during paranormal investigation. So we're actually setting out using equipment to try and capture evidence um, of the of unexplained phenomena or the paranormal, so that's kind of how you can measure it: is how much odd, strange things are you getting in a certain location? Is it a piece of audio? Is it photographic evidence? Is it video evidence? You know, if you can put a bunch of that together, then you can say, well, there's something definitely unexplained going on here, and it might be paranormal phenomena. So there's a lot of that all around. <laughs> The town, some places more than others. Um, what was your first paranormal experience here? My first paranormal experience here happened in the service station, uh, which was built 1918, finished 1919. Um, it served as a gas station and a tire shop for the town, and really the whole area up and uh, up until mid 1980s. And when I came to town, I was working in a sign shop in that location. And I happened to be working in the back of the shop one day and had cut some uh, metal aluminum type panels and was trying to clean up the edges with a knife blade and I happened to be working off a set of sawhorses and I had gone and found a flat metal file, you know, a standard, you know, foot long flat metal file. And I tried that out and didn't really like how that was working. So I walked about six to eight feet from where I was working and put this file on a table, on a flat work table. I went back to the sawhorses and continued working, doing what I was doing, and before too long, I felt something brush my leg, and there was a loud sound on the wall behind me, and then a big, you know, ding on the floor. It's a concrete floor. So I immediately looked down. There's a file on the floor. I look at the table. There's no file on the table anymore, and there's a dent in the wall. And I just could not explain how this metal file got from the table six to eight feet from me and hit the wall before hitting the ground. How did it travel that far without hitting the ground first? So I couldn't couldn't explain that. (laughs) How did that make you feel at the time? Uh, Well, I would say I was a bit unsettled for the rest of that day, Um, just only for the fact that I was wondering if it was supposed to hit me. and it missed <laughs> so that was kind of the unsettling part um that that was my first experience here it wasn't the first in my life for sure but uh it was a good one <laughs> i mean <laughs> an object flying across a room 
Um, and by the way, you know, I haven't had anything like that happen since. It was just that one time. Um, but it was, you know, a pretty strong occurrence. And if it was paranormal, um, it must have taken a lot of effort from whoever did it to actually throw this thing across the room. How do we define paranormal? Like, what's the difference between a ghost and paranormal activity? Um, well, if you break down the word, the actual word, paranormal, it's, it, it can be translated as next to normal. So something, and what is normal, it's whatever we perceive normal to be. So if you have something that can be considered next to normal, it's not, it might be normal, but it's, you know, next to normal. Well, then you kind of get into where things are unexplained. So any, the, there's a lot of things that can fall under the terminology of paranormal. There's ghosts, um, non-human spirits. Uh, a lot of people like to talk about demons all the time, especially on the TV shows. I've never experienced anything like that, but um, you could also consider Bigfoot as paranormal. Hmm. Uh, UFO, ufology, that could be considered as paranormal. So you can cryptid research, mythical creatures and, uh, you know, like the lizard man and, you know, different stories that have come out over the years from all over the world. That all kind of falls under this umbrella of paranormal. It's probably most often associated in our minds because of TV shows and kind of how the field has developed the last 20 years uh, for it to be associated with ghosts. But I think it encompasses so much more. Um, Near-death experiences, I mean, that's that can be considered paranormal. It's not something we fully understand, you know, by any stretch. So there's just a wide range of things, but most often I'd say the average person would consider paranormal, they think ghosts. They don't necessarily think Bigfoot right away. That's kind of in a whole other ball game in people's heads. So Different genre of it. Yeah, genre, that's a great way to put it. And yeah. ghosts? How would you define a ghost? Well, um, I there's varying opinions <laughs> and until somebody actually captures a spirit like what you're thinking now about ghostbusters in your head or casper you know or <laughs> casper you know it, it's kind of up in the air as to what a ghost is the leading theories kind of point to that a ghost is our soul it's our whatever energy our life energy um, if you look at one of the fundamental rules of science, you can't destroy energy. You'd only tra you can only transform it. So, you know, a lot of people, you know, will believe out there that once you're dead, you're, it's all gone. It's, you know, everything's just gone and you're put you in the ground and say, have a nice day. <laughs> yeah. You're worm food. Right, right. But, you know, we have some sort of intelligence in our brain that there's something more to it and the fact that we only use 10 percent of our brain you know some we could not even less. be yes right <laughs> you know we could just simply not be perceiving everything and that's what i think mm -hmm. is is what's happening um so i would i would define a ghost as a person just like you or i sitting here and they've their body has ended their body has ceased where does that energy go well it doesn't get destroyed it becomes transformed and so a lot of theories have been pointing to if i were to put a physical matter to it an electromagnetic field um and which i guess isn't really physical matter but people believe there's some sort of electromagnetic field that can show up in a space and then dissipate and show up you know two feet away as you know it quote unquote moves around so that's why you see a lot of electromagnetic field meters emf mm. meters on the shows and people using them because that's really one thing that does kind of make sense well our energy what is our energy we actually can conduct electricity ourselves we have naturally ionizing radiation which is a form of emf so it's possible to think that when you die that energy from you transforms and you know goes somewhere <laughs> yeah. and so we try and use these meters to try and at least rule out man-made sources of electromagnetic field and once you can rule those sources out what you have left is not normal is it paranormal possibly um so 
I would define a ghost as a person, and just like you or I, and but they're just in a different plane, I guess, a different dimension almost, mm-hmm. but still have ties to this dimension. Uh, or a lot of people will think about vibrations, energy is vibration, sound mm-hmm. wave is vibration, you know, and possibly if someone who's psychic may just have their body tuned to a different vibration and that's why maybe they are able to see things that other people can't uh just kind of depends on how your brain works and i'm certainly no brain surgeon but (laughs) so (laughs) there's so much mystery to it marky mark and the funky bunch were singing good vibrations back in the day was was that all about ghosts (laughs) Uh, probably not about ghosts it was probably about living your best life i would imagine but uh you know i think the same sort of thing would apply though so, you know, I think some spirits, um, their vibration level, whatever that is, if it matches up with somebody, that person's probably going to have an experience. And that's how they can kind of be seen or not be seen. Because um, there's a lot of uh, evidence out there of seeing, you know, a physical apparition of something that looks solid, looks like a real person, or mm-hmm. looks like a part of a person, but it looks... Yeah, real how are they the showing layers. themselves yeah. and so there's just so much mystery to it and actually a lot of mainstream um, physics and quantum physics is starting to look at old paranormal research um, from the old parapsychology um, people in the late 1800s that were in kind of like the Victorian spiritualist movement they, mm-hmm. there was a lot of scientists that actually started studying um psychic phenomena and psychics and mediums because they were kind of coming out all over the place at that time and so they were trying to actually put real fundamental science to it and they call it psychical research and so some of the mainstream yeah some of the mainstream science today is looking at some of that stuff because like with the higgs boson particle and i'm not uh, hip to that tell me a little bit about that okay so there's the hadron collider that's People will say I'm wrong. I want to say it's in Sweden, somewhere over in Europe. (laughs) And so what they're doing is they're taking these mega lasers, and it's basically like a big ring, and they I'm not a scientist, so forgive me, listeners. (laughs) But they they collide these laser beams, and these they found these particles. When this thing crashes into each other, they call it the God particle. Through this God particle, through physics and quantum physics, they've been able to prove the existence of nine other realities, nine other dimensions. This is like real science. And so that kind of opens the door to, okay, well, what's been going on with ghosts all these thousands of years? Mm -hmm. Are they utilizing this somehow? So some of the mainstream physics out there is looking at some paranormal theories and stuff so it's pretty interesting it's always developing you know it's uh, we're always learning well thank you for telling me that there is a restaurant above us we're in a basement (laughs) building (laughs) and they're cleaning up right now and uh it vibrates down here a little bit we're here in the floorboards creek and (laughs) yeah that's real people we're in the port gamble historical um what we call it building center we're in, the Port, we're in the Port Gamble Museum right now, which is located in the Port Gamble General Store and Cafe building. Right. I was upstairs. I saw quite a lot of fossils of sea life. And yeah. It's very fascinating. And then come down here and see all the, the history of the timber. It's, it's pretty darn cool. But yeah. it's also, you know, dark and creepy a little bit. There is. Well, <laughs> yeah, there's... If I didn't know there was a restaurant upstairs, <laughs> I would have thought I'd be in the thick of it right now. Sure. Well, there's stuff that happens in a lot of different locations, like we mentioned earlier. Museums, no exception. So you're just about to take some people on a ghost tour. That's Yep. You do this every weekend? Uh, well, in October. <laughs> I do you it every do it weekend. Um, you know, I kind of have been feeling like, you know, people think ghosts only come out in October, so we do more tours. <laughs> they yeah. come out all year round, people. Um, so I do them Fridays and Saturdays in October, and then I do once a month, November through April. And it's basically a three-hour tour, and it's mostly a history tour mm-hmm. with ghost stories all the stories that i can muster up that i've read written accounts or i've experienced myself um and it's my 11th season doing the tours this year 
Wow. And it's there's always new stuff to talk about. So, you know, I just I love it every year. I always look forward to it. Um, so it's a three-hour tour. We go into some locations, and but we walk around outside as well. We hit the cemetery, of course. would not be a ghost tour if you don't hit the cemetery. So <laughs> we do walk around outside, and uh, we've had uh, experiences happen on the tours, which is, I think, what's really kept people interested over the years. There's a, there's a real interest in the unexplained here in Port Gamble. Yeah. Three-hour tour. Is, isn't that in the Gilligan's Island theme song? <laughs> you might be right. Uh-oh. Uh, well, I haven't lost anybody yet. So. No? <laughs> I haven't lost anybody. Let me know if you find Ginger and Marianne. You're right. <laughs> oh, fun fact. Uh, the professor from Gilligan's Island used to live on Bainbridge Island until he recently passed away. You know, I heard that before. Yeah. Yeah. So you got a, a short um, ghost story you could share with the listeners here on Podcastville? Yeah, well, yeah. Um, I've got three hours worth of stories, but I'll tell you one. <laughs> <laughs> How much time we got here? Yeah. yeah we, got, we got 20 minutes at least. So, um, basically, well, I'm trying to think of one of my favorite ones. One of my favorite stories was in the Walker Ames house uh, here in Port Gamble. It's probably one of the most recognized homes in town. It was built in 1888, finished in 1889. Um and nobody lives in it, right? Nobody's lived there since 1995. And um, basically, teams from all over the world, paranormal research teams from all over the world have been here. And just for the amount of evidence that seems to come out of this house. So is it like an Airbnb? No, nope, it's, it's closed off. It's locked up. Um, and it's, you know, needs some work done to it. But uh, it's just an empty location. And so... There's just been so much evidence of the paranormal coming out of this house. And I would also like to make a quick note that when I say evidence, that doesn't equal proof. And that's something that, you know, a lot of us in the paranormal field try and put out there that just because you caught something isn't proof of it. It's evidence of it. So this house particularly produces a lot of audio evidence, a lot of unexplained audio stuff. So how do people get access to it? Is it... Do you have the keys and is it yep. just you, on the tour? We do it for the tours. <laughs> we do it for the tours. And uh, we also hold uh, Santa's workshop on the first floor of the house during our country Christmas festival, which is always the second weekend in December. So this year it's December 11th and 12th. So that's another way people can kind of go in and look around. But we don't let anybody off the first floor. Um, not because of ghosts, but just to keep where we know where everybody is. Um, so... I don't know, this place is, it's just really interesting. If I could describe the house and how it feels and all the years I've had experiences there and witnessing other people having experiences or people sending me pieces of evidence, imagine you're holding the novel War and Peace, big, huge novel, Mm -hmm. really thick, and you're just kind of letting the pages fall and you just say stop at a random point and you open the book and start the story from there. That's kind of what this house feels like. There's so many different layers to it. Um, but I don't know what it is about there. But my story is not an audible one, though. This It's more rare to see something in there. Shadow people and figures, you know, shadowy figures moving around is fairly common. But seeing a full-body apparition is pretty rare. And full body what? A full bodied apparition. So an apparition of a spirit. So they reveal themselves. Sometimes they look real. Sometimes you can they look translucent. You can almost kind of see through them. So one particular evening a couple of years ago, I had a private tour. I think this was about three years ago. And uh, basically it was standing in the front foyer of the house. We did have the lights off. And I had my flashlight on, and I just started talking about the history of the home. And we heard what so- sounded like a foot dragging on the ground behind me. Just It was quick, you know, kind of just like a swoosh sound. And so, of course, that caught all of our attention. And I kind of turned my shoulder and my light, and all of a sudden there was a woman standing next to me. And almost, almost touching me. And... My flashlight beam hit her right in the eyeballs, and she did not react. She didn't blink, anything. She was looking just straight ahead, like straight out the windows. 
And of course, we all gasped. And once we all gasped, she disappeared. She just vanished. Multiple people saw this. All of us saw it. And at that point, the tour was pretty much over. They were done. <laughs> <laughs> I could just see an Airbnb up where you, oh, okay. you set it up. <laughs> yeah. You know, just spend a night if you dare. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So. And is that a Victorian type style yeah, home? That is a Victorian style yeah. home. Yep. You Creepy got Creepy dollhouse, right? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, there's not. Uh, some investigators have brought dolls to place in the attic because it's believed that children's spirits can be experienced in the attic and so people bring toys for them and try and have them hey can you knock the teddy bear over can you knock the dominoes over you know they'll set up different things and see if they can actually get something to move and we did get a piece of video evidence um, that, that a team had sent me of one of the balls that's on the floor up there it rolled a couple feet one direction when nobody was up there and then you could think okay that might be a gravity thing how settling right it might Foundation maybe it leans yeah. a little bit but then a short time later the ball rolled back to where it was so it wasn't a gravity thing <laughs> so interesting so there is some toys in in the attic but uh people are just they'll bring them for the the children spirits in the house and do they get to go upstairs and place those? Or do, yeah. yeah, yeah. If if there, I do public investigations, which are once a month, November through April, and those it's a three hour session just in the Walker Ames house, and we kind of go through each floor very thoroughly. I show people how to use, you know, some of the EMF meters, how you should use them to scan a location, um, and then we ask questions in the dark to ourselves <laughs> and see if anything <laughs> comes shows up on the audio. So. Uh, but sometimes in that house, there is a couple of spirits that seem to be very vocal. And so a lot of times we actually catch disembodied voices where we hear it live when it happens. But there's just as many, if not more, uh, EVPs. And that's what the house is really known for. EVPs meaning? EVPs, electronic voice phenomenon. So that's you're investigating and you're asked questions all night. You're talking, trying to get something to say hello, and you hear nothing. Well, then you go and you listen to your audio file and there's stuff, answers or voices, things that seem to mysteriously be imprinted onto that audio file. So um, that's a, that's considered electronic voice phenomenon. So the, there's a difference between that and a disembodied voice. So there's both in that house a lot. So this Port Gamble is also a pretty famous venue for weddings. You know, it's beautiful out here. Yeah. Does anybody request a ghost wedding venue? I, well, nobody's requested a ghost wedding venue. But over the years, I have done a number of tours. People do their rehearsal, and they go have a rehearsal dinner, and then they come and do a ghost walk that night. So uh, as kind of their rehearsal special event. So I've done a number of those over the years. So that sounds like fun. It is a lot of fun, and, and the brides and grooms and the wedding parties and families will come along, and uh, we just always have a blast. So, uh, yeah, this is an um, amazing place to get married. Um, we average over 80 weddings a year here, and, um, you know, we actually did okay through the pandemic and everything. Mm -hmm really picking back up but uh it's, it's mostly just, outdoor venue right uh well no it's, it, there's indoor you can have a traditional ceremony in the historic church built in 1879 mm, or you yeah. can do an outdoor wedding in the summer at the pavilion and do your reception right there too so i think what we offer it's understated elegance and unrivaled client service that's like our brand for the weddings and uh we really try and be flexible to what everyone wants mm -hmm. and uh, so I think that goes a long way um, when people are looking for wedding venues someone who's up front about what they can do and they're also flexible about it and the price point's really good too so I think we're just we've got a great thing here for weddings and people just love it yeah it's quite beautiful out here for sure yeah can you tell me let's get off getting married and get back to some murder <laughs> <laughs> What, segue. <laughs> segue. Can you tell me a little bit about the four deaths at the sawmill? And well, I don't really know all the details, but um, you know, I've heard from some old timers, you know, that worked here, and there are a couple of written accounts um, somewhere in the museum. <laughs> it's like a needle in a haystack, 
but from what I've been told from people that worked here and also people who really know the history really well here, it, it, was, it was mostly equipment related or getting sucked into the planer was one mm, of them. That's fun. Yeah, there was uh, somebody hit by a forklift. Um, there, it's, I mean, gruesome. Just not, not a good death. <laughs> mm, that's why left-handed people should not mess with yeah. machinery. Right. But, you know, when you think about 142 years this mill ran, and there's only four, act, four deaths down there. Now, we know that people did possibly get injured on the mill site and come up to the town's hospital, which is on Rainier Avenue. It's now called the Painted Lady. But uh, it's also one of the second oldest buildings in town. We know people died there. You know, somebody was sick or they got, you know, injured on the mill site. Maybe they got an infection, you know, from their wounds. So we know people died there, but really only four on the mill site itself, which is pretty amazing. I know that there was a lot of fires over the years, Mm -hmm. and that can be explained easy. Just look at any old picture of inside a mill house, and all the guys in there have cigars hanging out their mouths. Yeah. (laughs) Sawdust. Yeah, and all the sawdust. So, Well, tell me a little bit about... um the water supplies, the, the twin towers that you have, have here. Yes, yeah, so one was built in 1890, one was built in 1895, and they're two 50,000 gallon tanks. And they were mostly used for fire suppression. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's a fire pond now, which I believe was installed in the early 70s. Um, so before they had that fire pond, they had to have a reservoir of water ready to go. And so that's why those, those were built. Um, and then I. I think they were shut down around 1970 or so from being used. So Mm -hmm. they're just hollowed out. And do you have a a fire department here in Port Gamble? No, we don't. Do you have a hospital? We don't. But Kitsap County's first hospital was here, uh, opened in 1929, and that's where the fire pond sits. Uh, They Mm. tore down the hospital to put the fire pond there, um, which is a shame. (laughs) But the house, that hospital was actually Edwin Ames' house. He built it in around 1900. He left and retired in 19, around 1925, and then they kind of fitted that house because it was so big to be uh, the county's hospital. Hmm. And then when Harrison came in, I think in the late 50s, um, they stopped using it as a hospital. So it, it was, I really wish that building was still here. <laughs> <laughs> so, Peter, you. Not only do you handle a lot of things here at Port Gamble, mm-hmm. you have this ghost conference coming up, mm-hmm. 12th Annual. You're yep. also a avid speaker at other conferences, correct? Well, I'm trying to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel lucky if I get asked to speak somewhere. Um, I've been lucky to be able to go to the Oregon Ghost Conference the past six, seven years, and, and we'll do a speaking presentation or class, and I help out with the tours. It's, it's held in Seaside last mm. week of March. Um, and so I'll go and I'll help the organizer there with some of his tours of Seaside during the event. And I was just down in Centralia for their first ever uh, paranormal conference, and that was a lot of fun. Um, a lot of cool old places down there in the, the downtown area. So that was a lot of fun. But, uh, yeah, the Port Gamble Ghost Conference is kind of, you know, something I put a lot of work into every year. Um, last year we had a virtual conference, which actually went awesome. Um, so I've brought a virtual option again this year, but we're doing in-person as well. So uh, it's going to be November 5th through 7th. Well, and What would people expect from this conference? Yeah. Well, every year what we try and do is we try and get great speakers who are really active in the paranormal field. So people who are actually out investigating, researching, c- collecting data, people actually out doing work or they're active in psychic mediumship and they're out doing things from that side of things not a scientific side more you know the psychic side but so we try and mix it up <clears throat> and um in years past we've had s- some speakers from europe come in and and talk about all, all the stuff they go through over there but uh this year we've got everybody's from the pacific northwest and there's a really great paranormal research community in the Pacific Northwest. It's unique to the rest of America. Uh, everybody up here really does well with sharing their work mm. and sharing it with each other and sharing evidence and things like that. It's really more a lot more competitive 
um, around the rest of the country. So this year we've got everybody's from the Pacific Northwest. So starts Friday night. We got a couple of speakers and then um, a class, and you can take different kinds of classes throughout the weekend. Um, so what would a class consist of? It's fifteen bucks, and it's an hour long. And there's um, classes on how to use pendulums or um, like dowsing rods, you know, things like that. Ouija board stuff. Not Ouija board <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Not Ouija board stuff. But uh, there's also, um, you know, a documenting the paranormal, uh, how to cleanse yourself. You know, if you are in a creepy location you know how do you get rid of stuff and you burn some sage well that's that could be part of it um a lot of it's really just setting your intention and setting the ground rules for things in that location that they are not to leave with you Um, i used to be so good at setting intentions (laughs) my planning went out the door yeah so but so all weekend there's investigations of many locations those are separate tickets um on Friday night, so there's two investigation time slots, and then um, Saturday night there's three investigation time slots and many different locations to investigate. Speakers all day Saturday with some classes, and on Sunday there's some more speakers, and then panel discussions, which is a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, when, once we get into the panel discussions, you get every, all the speakers' point of view to questions, and we take questions from the audience. Um, so where would people... Um Find the Ghost Conference tickets and... and Ghost Conference, yeah, you want to go to portgamble.com and just go to the events tab and you'll see the Ghost Conference page there. Mm -hmm. So go to portgamble.com, go to the events tab, you'll see it. You can get tickets. It's run through Eventbrite. So um, there's also the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash PG Ghost Conference, and you can get... Mm -hmm the QR codes to get tickets right there. So there's an in-person option for the whole weekend, 45 bucks. Classes and investigations are separate tickets, 15 bucks and 10 bucks. And there's lodging available as well. Too, yep, right? Paul's Bow Inn is offering an awesome deal, and so I think that's where most everybody's going to be staying. Some people stay at the Port Gamble guest houses as well. Um, but uh, there's a virtual option this year, which I want to stress because if people don't want to come out and go to things, the virtual option is 20 bucks for the whole weekend, and basically you get front row seats to all the speaking presentations and panel discussions. So it's a pretty cool deal. Definitely. You can learn a lot about the paranormal just from watching that. And so it's 20 bucks for that. So I hope if you, if you can't make it out here that, you know, check out the virtual option. Sounds like some ghosts are trying to break in right now, so yeah. I'll probably let you go. <laughs> um, last thing... You have a podcast on, on this as well. Can you tell people yeah. where to find that? Uh, I have the show called The Paranormal Pete Show. Uh, my sister kind of dubbed me that, so it's stuck. Love it. <laughs> uh, and I'm on WLTKDB.com. It's Let's Talk Radio. And my show is every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Pacific. And I'll go an hour or two hours, but I have guests ranging from psychic mediums to parapsychologists to Bigfoot guys and so gals that, that's, and UFO um, people. It's recorded too, so if you're not yep any it, anywhere you get your podcast from, you can find my show on there. Okay, I'll leave it in the show notes as well for Podcastville. Yeah, Peter, I appreciate your time. This is fun. I think we could talk a lot, a yeah. lot more, and I think we should. Um, but for right now, you know, I'll return you to this angry mob that's waiting outside for for <laughs> All you. All right, and I uh, appreciate your time. Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. You've been listening to the Bystander Podcast. Be kind.